I, we are live. Hello, Dreamland. Uh, welcome to Wonder versus Dread, Encountering the Gods in Fiction and Real Life. I am the moderator. Mo I'm the moderator. I'm the moderator. Evan J. Peterson. Um, I am an author, game writer, uh, Cthulhu Con fanatic, etc. And it's great to be here. Um, the artwork behind me is created by Valerie Heron. This is a portrait of Hecate, and I think I think her stuff's in the Mall of Cthulhu right now. All right, so. Uh, I'll have the panelists one by one introduce themselves. I guess I'll call y'all so we can keep rolling and then we're gonna get into it. So we're here to discuss uh, the experience of encountering the divine and the sublime uh, in, in fiction as well as in life. And we've got a very varied panel of life experiences and uh, spiritual backgrounds career backgrounds, et cetera. So let's get into it. Uh, Craig, would you start us off? Okay, I am Craig Lawrence Gidney. I'm the author of A Spectral Hue and the artwork behind me is the cover work for uh, A Spectral Hue. And A Spectral Hue deals with actually accessing the divine and the sort of scary in art. And I think that's why I was invited on. Thank you. Nadia? Great. Uh, hi, I'm Nadia Bulkin. Um, I'm a horror writer. Uh, my collection is She Said Destroy. And the background behind me is my room in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Amanda? Hello, I'm Amanda Downham. I'm a horror fantasy, dark fantasy author. Um, fairly recently, my short fiction collection, Still So Strange was up for a little <laughs> fantasy award, yay. Hell yeah. Yay. So yay. Um, I'm also in my secret identity, a mortician. <laughs> <laughs> and my background is just my room outside of Austin, Texas. Although I must also give a big shout out to Valerie Heron. Her artwork is fantastic. And I bought that very print at HPLF last year. Me too. Uh, Zen. I am Zen E. Rocklin. Um, you might recognize my government name as Terry Clark. Uh, I am a horror writer, mostly weird and um, supernatural, and I also write dark fantasy. Awesome. Glad to have you here, Zen. Rose. Hi, everybody. I'm Rose O'Keefe. I'm the owner and publisher at Eraserhead Press. I also run and print Deadite Press, Fungasm Press, and uh, the New Bizarro Author Series. And I live here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I focus on publishing Bizarro fiction and weird horror. Sweet. And Justin. So I'm uh, Justin Key. I am a writer of horror and science fiction. Uh, my novelette just came out in Tor.com, The Perfection of Teresa Watkins, free up to read right now. Um, also went to Clarion West with Evan, and uh, I am also a psychiatrist and a father. All right, let's get into it. So one thing we uh, we talked about at our pre-meeting for the to prepare uh, was the idea of ego death and the things that prompt us to lose our identity in a moment uh, and to just have our identity possibly eradicated. Uh, you know, people who study Zen would call that Satori, perhaps. But I think the pandemic has caused a lot of us to face ego death and ego threat. So. Uh, let's talk about ego death and <clears throat> encountering the things that show us how minuscule and weak we really are. Anybody want to take take? This I feel one? like Justin should start. He's the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Key? Oh, well, um, 
maybe disappointed, but the the first thing that came to mind was actually you know Stephen King's It, which I um, revisited recently. Uh, I read it about ten years ago, and then I recently um, revisited again. Audiobook, audiobook is really good. And thinking about uh, Pennywise and the Deadlights, and I was thinking when brought up Eco Deck before, like that 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 fear of just being everything being stripped away, and it's you know kind of unimaginable what that may be like looking into the dead like uh, what what horror they see we can't really imagine it as well because it's not defined for us but then that means that whatever it is whatever is the most horrific thing for us which is kind of what Pennywise embodies that's what we are going to kind of face um, and I think that there's that's the fear really of the unknown and I think that with this pandemic um, it's the the fear of uncertainty you know, right now, and, and even since for all of 2020, like it being out, there's still a lot of uncertainty. What exactly is this virus? Who, who, why does it exactly affect people the way it does? How can I catch it? What can I do to kind of be safe? You know, and there are, there are a lot of things in terms of being informed uh, and being, you know, that we, like some simple things I think that we can do that decrease our risk and that are responsible to do, there's still you know, a lot of uncertainty in terms of every time I go out, am, am I going to be exposed in some way? If I get it, what's going to happen? Um, how long is this going to last? You know, how is society going to, like, re return back to the same? And all of the other things that we value so much, how is this going to affect that? So I think that there's a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, and that's, and that's horrifying. I think so. Oh. No, Zen, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking something as simple as stargazing uh, can really break a person down and make you realize that, holy shit, I am nothing. When you are staring at, um, I mean, it's it's hard when you live in a city, but if if you do get the chance to go out to like somewhere that has very little light pollution, um, is like being able to see the Milky Way and, um, and things of that sort is, it's very humbling. It's extremely humbling. Um, and looking up at shooting stars that are long dead, things of that sort, and even looking at the other planets and realizing that there's an a whole set another kind of function to those planets that have absolutely nothing to do with us that is that in itself is is humbling without having to read horror i i absolutely agree and i mean that is as close as i have ever come personally to an experience of the sublime is things like that just looking at the sky being deep underground in natural caverns, things like that, where you do, I mean, humbling is exactly the word I would use. And it's, for me, the experience of being confronted by something that is so much bigger than me and so much more profound and it doesn't care. But that's very comforting. Mm -hmm. To me, the idea of a universe that human beings can imagine in its entirety is very sad and a little frightening because I want to be part of something so much bigger. And I mean, human imagination is great, but humans kind of suck sometimes. And I would really yeah. like there to be vast worlds out there that aren't dealing with us right now. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I used to often think there really is nothing new, nothing new under the sun. Um, but I love Octavia Butler's quote, if there's nothing new under the sun, find new suns. <laughs> it reminds me of something my mother um, said when she explained how she lost religion when she was a teenager was somebody had described heaven to her and like, it was like an eternity beside God or something like that. And she was like, this sounds so boring. I cannot <laughs> imagine. And yeah, um, I think, I think, um, I think Zen's point about stargazing in contrast with Justin's point about um, the pandemic sort of has this two sides of the coin. Like one 
is a situation where we feel like for stargazing, it's humbling, it's like nice, it's pleasant to think of this huge universe and like it, you know, makes your problems feel very small. Um, and then on the other side, the pandemic is you feel out of control and you feel like it's going to hurt you, you know, personally and you can't control it. So I think that those are actually two really great examples of, um, I think the duality that we're talking about here is, you know, how, how, how people react to that feeling of being out of control and being faced with something that they can't understand. Yeah. Well, well, and I think that that's at the heart of what defines cosmic horror, right? So, you know, cosmic horror is <clears throat> horror that examines the feeling of fear and awe and dread when we're faced with something unknowable, the unknown and the, the bigness of everything. Um, so rather than like other horror that might be focused on the gore or uh, things like that, that's exactly the topic of cosmic horror is that sensation of confronting the unknown. And I think, so something that Craig brought up yesterday that I think is very important is, I mean, we were talking a lot in general about personal perspective, you know, whether in fiction or in real life, but it's that idea that looking at cosmic horror, going back to Lovecraft, when it's your protagonist is a well-to-do white guy, probably educated, who is suddenly confronted with his insignificance and it's this horrible thing, but you know, look at something like the Ballad of Black Tom, Victor Laval, where you're, the main character is dealing with all the day-to-day -day human bullshit that you know, people who aren't well-to-do white people have to deal with constantly. And it puts a very different context on this idea of, I'm being confronted by something that's so much bigger than humanity. And I think that's, I think it's very easy historically to fall into that, well, here is one kind of reaction to cosmic horror told through a very specific keyhole. And I think there are so many more experiences out there and other points of view that weird fiction has not looked into historically as much as it could. As a, that's as absolutely a, changing now, I think. As a uh, someone who is a dual minority, uh, queer and black, the idea of sort of being ignored or that it's all meaningless, we face that every single day. Um, even now, in this particular time period, we have to deal with the fact that we have people who want to just eradicate, they don't just like me just for being, just for existing, that, that somehow I'm just an affront. And so as a result, sort of being meaningless just doesn't have the same zing to me because, you know, I feel like I have to, or, you're always in the mindset of always having to justify why you exist in the beginning. And, you know, a lot of white people don't get that because yeah. they're sort of the center. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what I was, uh, was thinking as well as like the, the infringement of whiteness in our daily lives and like in being when, there are discussions about um, diversity, something as simple as, you know, checking, checking, uh, checking off the tick marks of like pr people of color, women. And it's always that weird slot of that's not discussed of black women that is <laughs> that is so blatant to me so yeah it's 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 definitely something in which um as far as as there's a different kind of of ego death when it comes to marginalized folks when marginalized folks have to end up facing um something something of the sublime it's more of a relief it's like, to me, it's more of a, of a relief in the sense of, oh, thank fuck. 
the, the, sorry. Yeah, I can curse. Sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, thank fuck. Like, um, you know, this is this, I, you know, all this struggle, all of this feeling insignificant from day one kind of pans out in a way. So it's, it's, it's definitely interesting to, you know. It reminds me of the fact that I also, a story that's at least submitted, I don't know when it's going to come out, is about a Black trans woman and her, her encounter with the sublime, and particularly with this uh, trans goddess character that's actually in an uh, Afro-Brazilian religion called uh, Pombojira. And her particular connection with it is like, thank God you're here. You can go and cut all those other people who are bothering me. Whereas other people, the people who are sort of like against her are like horrified beyond belief. And this is why I'm, I'm so excited that the genres are finally actively embracing and actively finding and uplifting marginalized voices because there's so much more that we're not used to seeing so many perspectives that we haven't been reading or seeing on tv and it's only just begun we have a lot of work to do but i love that you know um it, it, i i'm thinking about uh not not necessarily in pop culture, but in world, uh, world folklore and world spirituality, the idea of the goddess Kali in Hinduism. And in the West, from a, you know, from a Abrahamic perspective, Kali seems like a warrior goddess. She's scary, she has fangs, she cuts off heads. And in, in authentic Hinduism, which I am not an expert on, so, you know, grain of salt, but she's also a mother goddess. She's not just a destroyer, she's a creator. And she's beyond beyond these tidy uh, little sock puppet versions that we really like in the West. We like Satan to be a bobblehead we can put on the dashboard. We like Jesus to have a beard and straight blonde hair, you know, and these are sock puppets of the bigger, the bigger energies. Yeah, like we were discussing yesterday how um, there is the truth of, the so-called truth of uh, Judeo-Christianity in the sense of um, if someone were to actually hear Jesus, is, Jesus or God's true name, they would lose their mind or they would survive, they would die, things of that sort, um, and that we can't fathom angels and and because they're fearsome things um and i mean the bible i think is like the og the triple og cosmic <laughs> horror especially book of revelations um mm -hmm. and to kind of contextualize it as far as the importance that we feel as as individuals the kind of the the bombastic type of of ego like <laughs> like that is what the bible asks you in a lot of ways to do away with um and a lot of religions like yeah sorry yeah but yeah that's pretty much it i, th I think that is um uh, especially like present i think here in um Western culture and society, like how uh, certain people's interpretations of, you know, the sublime and of horror end up being propagated to, to others. Because if you think about, like, if, if you think about, um, uh, sorry, and kids at home, they have a little kids <laughs> in the background. Um, Thank you. But, for you know. <laughs> Sublime think horror. About, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> sublime horror right there. <laughs> that's that's Good my, that was my dead, that was my dead life that when they said when they said the schools are closing, that was me. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you know, thinking thinking of in terms of like what somebody like somebody when people take or culture takes like something like the Bible and then they take 
what they interpret to be like, what is my savior? What is what is my hell? What is my heaven? And then that is spread out to other cultures and it doesn't, one, it doesn't always uh, ring true to actually to the source material and it doesn't ring true in terms of like being able to connect with like, okay, this is what I'm striving for. Okay, this is what I'm supposed to be afraid of. Um, and I think that, you know, going back to, to, to horror, like the really good horror in terms of really good writing is able to um, kind of evoke these feelings like kind of across the board, um, able to, uh, you know, even be open about that something that somebody may see as horrific, somebody else may see as beautiful. Um, and being open to that being a possibility and being, I think, aware of that when creating art can make it have even more of that effect for someone on, on whichever, which side of the line um, they may end up on. Because um, you're not trying to necessarily tell them this is what horrifies me. It's like, you know, this is, I'm trying to get at what horrifies you, what, may, what evokes beauty in you. Um, uh, by trying to get at some undefinable beauty or horror that I feel in myself, like as an artist. Thank you, Justin. That that uh, when you were talking about to one person it's horrifying, to another it may be beautiful. That reminds me of um, uh, Umberto Eco has a book called On Ugliness, uh, and he just takes this survey of the concept of ugly throughout time, and uh, one chapter is devoted to this to this uh, sort of subgenre of Christian art in which we see Christ and the martyrs absolutely tortured, ripped apart, cut to pieces. And this was considered beautiful uh, for a long time because their suffering for the rest of us, their suffering is the gift that they give to us. Um, and I, I should have figured that out on my own, but I didn't. It took Umberto Eco to point out to me that, you know, one person sees Passion of the Christ and it's like watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Another person sees Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ and sees the most beautiful gift we've ever been given. You know what that reminds me of? The movie Martyrs? Mm, yeah. I still haven't seen it. Okay, I won't spoil it, but there's, there's a very interesting sort of like, almost like Clive Barker-esque meditation on pain and like the idea of like exquisite pain and suffering being mm -hmm. something that helps the soul transcend like your worldly confines um and you're right evan like there's a very strong sensibility of like blessed be the pain sanctified be the pain um that yeah for me that's like very very barker but i think that it's definitely like a, a permutation of um of kind of Lovecraftian cosmic stuff too, makes a lot of sense. I'm glad you bought, brought up Clive Barker. I, <clears throat> I put him in the description, but we didn't really talk about him yesterday. And yeah, that, that transcendental suffering is absolutely uh, part of Barker's whole, whole S&M horror aesthetic with the Cenobites. And I, I am like a mega fan of the Hellraiser mythos. And I love that the Cenobites only come to get you when you ask them to. You, know, you, you request they come and torture you. And then uh, in, in the second film, when they all actually go to hell and we see what hell looks like, um, the God of hell is not Satan. The God of hell is Leviathan, which is a giant puzzle floating in the air. And you know, again, that idea that these these entities are so unimaginable that, you know, like uh, a horned dude with bat wings and a pitchfork is <laughs> not going to do it. But even like even thinking about Clive Barker's various mythos um, and and transcendental pain. Like even my favorite book of his, which I know a lot of people don't like, but I loved Galilee. Um, 
and Galilee, again, even as it's supposed to be his romance book, like along with Cold Heart Canyon, and it's still just filled with torture and pain. And I like the idea of the Cenobites coming when you only when you call them, because you still have no idea what you're in for is what it really comes down to. It's like, yeah, I totally get this. Just like when, you know, something as simple as tattooing, um, you know, I recently got my hand tattooed and every single spot on your body, like the more you tattoo in a shorter time, you are used to the pain and you can kind of adjust. But the longer mm -hmm. it, it has been, you can say, oh yeah, I got this, this is fine, it's no big deal. <laughs> but the second it hits a nerve, you're just like, oh, oh, that that's new, that's brand new. <laughs> so you think you're getting into something that you know, but you really don't. And it does bring you to another place. And like, I think that's one of the things that I absolutely love and still do about Five Barker's work. Um, thank God he's coming out with a, uh, new poems and a new book, a new short story collection, I believe. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that I absolutely loved about his work is, is how you can ask for it, but you have no idea what you're really, really in for. <laughs> well, I, it has second it... That. I, I just got fresh ink on the inside of my elbow and that is exactly where I went when <laughs> Evan started talking about the transcendence of pain. Greg, right. so have you, has anyone watched the Exorcist TV series? Yeah. No, no. One that of the things that's interesting about it is that it goes beyond, you know, the usual Reagan sort of, it has that story in there, but it, the idea is that the Catholic church is in on sort of getting demons back in because demons are fallen angels and, these priests want to be possessed because they want to have angelic powers. And it's just a fascinating idea that, that somehow even religion is sort of like, it's not clear whether or not, where is God in that situation if the very people who are supposedly talking about it are sort of trying to access this weird, cosmically disgusting stuff. Which is very Lovecraftian, right? Yeah. It's like calling to the moon. That's actually something that I've noticed. I've been, I never watched Supernatural when it originally aired, but I've been exposed to a lot of it recently. And it's something that I've also struggled with how to do. And it's this idea of you're taking a, you know, Abrahamic tradition of there's a heaven and a hell and angels and demons and, and Lucifer fell, but they, they cannot address God as a sublime concept, either because you're dealing with a Western audience who wouldn't respond well, or just because your personal imagination can't wrestle with God the sublime. And so you have all of this, all of the other stories, like you can make Lucifer a villain or a hero or an anti-hero or whatever you want, but how do you, and I noticed that there's so many narratives where God is absent and they'll either explain it or they won't, but it's always God is gone. The throne is empty and it's all, it's the angels squabbling and dealing with man and all of the fallout. And it's, it's a narrative that I find works sometimes, but it also does seem to just be a way, it's sort of like the indescribable cop out of, I can't wrestle with this concept, it's too big. So we're just going to move, shove it out of frame. Creature does that. The mm -hmm. show, I haven't read the comics in ages. So, but Preacher does that in the sense of, you know, God is missing. God is on vacation. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs> so. Rose? Um, I, I thought it was really stimulating your... Uh, description of when you're getting tattooed and then you start to kind of build up a resistance to the pain if it stays in the same place but when it moves somewhere else that's when it like really yanks you back into that feeling um 
because if you think about horror in that way, as writers, are you always trying to cover new ground when it comes to those uh, issues with people, or are you are you staying with this, trying to trigger the same kind of emotional content, but in delivering new sort of examples of of what might trigger that? Um, does that question make sense? Like, yeah. I guess when I'm, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Uh, Justin, you first, then I'll go. Or, um, I, was I, I was just gonna say that I touch on both um, in my fiction because um, those same trigger points uh, resonate differently for my background and for my characters. So um, while it may be like uh, I have a story out on tour.com um, called uh, The Night Sun um, and it deals with domestic violence. And I got a lot of feedback telling me that they never really understood, like a lot of people didn't understand domestic violence from that particular kind of perspective where both parties are, are responsible for the continuous violence and that there is a complacency, uh, a forced complacency of being, feeling comfortable in the hell that you've created. Um, uh, and that was a perspective that they'd never seen before um, because, you know, in horror, if you're dealing with domestic violence, it's usually written by a man and it's usually about the man beating down the woman and, um, and you know, the woman is this kind of, it's, it's a situation in, which feels very life, I'll put it that way. Um, so um there are definitely points that i that i go over that i've read before that just have different have a different perspective and there are definitely things that you know i go into new territory for sure i was thinking um uh, uh in response to what rose said kind of thinking a little bit and, and i know you uh invoked me to kind of bring up some of my medical background before and now I can. Um, but when thinking about uh, uh, I treat patients who have uh, some patients who have anxiety and use like cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the things that uh, was told to me um, beginning my training is, you know, to think of it as if somebody's definitely afraid of like a certain horror mo movie, you know, if they sit down and watch it 27 times, eventually they're not gonna be able to be afraid of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also thinking about that in a way of, as for example, if I, if I have a patient who I'm trying to kind of help get over like the fear of driving, if I have them drive on the same street, you know, eventually they're going to feel really good about driving on that street. But what about the street that's next over? So like being able to kind of get a variety of experiences so that they can also kind of uh, tell themselves in different ways, like, okay, this is okay. And on the flip side of that, I, I, I I, you can take that and kind of turn it around in the same way in horror um, in trying to kind of evoke uh, emotions from, um, sorry, from readers. Um, and also grow as a writer for one example myself is like kind of a personal uh, uh, trauma that I've gone through is like losing um, a very close cousin of mine who's about eight years older than me when I was 17 to, uh, to gun violence in DC. And I've tried to um, recreate that I think so many times and and recreate some of the different horror that that's been for me um, and being able to explore it in different ways uh, in different stories and it does and sometimes in, you know I catch myself thinking like oh is this is this based from that same trauma um, and it is and but it's okay because I'm not writing like the same exact settings or not exact but same like theme etc cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to kind of touch people in different ways and have them kind of um, experience a little bit of kind of what my my humanity is in that, but from different angles. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to try to do uh, as a writer, not only for, you know, to be able to get through to, to more readers, um, but also for as yourself, the therapeutic part of writing and what we are, what we're putting on a page. Like, it's, I think it's healing for us in different ways. Justin, do you ever think of your readers as patients? 
thought it was like a Freudian slip. Um, it's it's uh, no, I I wouldn't say I, I think of them as patients. I haven't actively, but I, I I do feel that if I've gotten further in writing and I've had you know people respond um, and say that felt that made me feel heard, and also knowing like the place that I come from in terms of a few different areas where uh, you know being a person of color in America. Um, being uh, a person that works with people who experience um, uh, struggles with mental health and me being in a place where kind of like these knowledge from a various different parts of, of my life, if that's going to be reflected onto the page, am I representing those well? And, and, and I feel I need, I feel uh, a responsibility to continue to help people feel heard um, uh, in a responsible way. And that could be analogous to like when I sit down with a patient, making sure that I'm kind of, you know, um, doing the best by them. Um, so yeah, sometimes I do feel like uh, a burden with that, just to, you know, like as we say with in doctor, I like, do no harm. I, I don't want I don't want my writing to do harm. Um, and uh, but to even kind of get in that space where you're wondering about that means like you're in a place that, you know, you could potentially do a lot of good. Hopefully. Thank you for commenting on that, Justin. Um, so it, tattoos keep coming up in this conversation and it, we, we find tattooing uh, around the world. It was imported to the West, I believe. Um, I don't think the Druids invented tattooing. <laughs> they might have, I don't know. Uh, but in many cultures, uh, tattoos are a spell they are a magic spell they are a charm a talisman and i think that the pain involved and the the transcendence of the pain of tattooing is is very much part of that spell craft absolutely um even something like <laughs> Uh, so they, there is a chart that marks out the most painful parts of the body. And as much as we make fun of it, the tramp stamp is actually the most painful part. Um, and by tramp stamp, which I know is not exactly the greatest description ever, but the lower back. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember distinctly when I got it, that a lot of it I spent with my mouth open and my my eyes closed and my friends were like are you are you having an orgasm right now it's like oh no 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 no, no. it's not like that it's not like that but it brings you to that place that that same kind of wavelength in the same way where it's like holy shit like this is this is painful let me transmute it in some kind of way so, yeah, and I think that's what reading a uh, good horror fiction and watching horror movies can do to a person as well. You know, like going through that kind of painful experience with characters that either survive or die and you have that catharsis or that kind of feeling at the end, like you've earned something, you've made it through, you've survived, like your mind has been through all of the same torturous aspects that they did, except for you were safe in your home or whatever um so that that i think is a really interesting point is it any wonder that the horror fans are in better mental health than everybody else in the pandemic you know we... i don't know if i would say that's universal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean what, I, what what all that made me think of honestly it's not tattooing but is cutting like self-harm mm. and the same you know I was reading about sort of like what goes into the psychology of that. And one of the things that I found most interesting was the idea that the pain receptors, like the pain part of the brain is very close to the relief part of the brain. And so if you expose yourself to physical pain, you know, there's going to be relief coming after you teach yourself that because just in, you know, like it's painful and then it's, it stops. And then you're like, oh, it feels so much better just because there's no more pain anymore. And your brain learns to put the physical and emotional link there. And so you're like, oh, the relief will come emotionally 
when the physical pain departs. But first I have to go through the physical pain. Like, and I've been doing that sort of thing since I was a kid and I never really understood why I did it, but always, you know, I always did. So um, yeah, it's really, it's a very interesting dynamic that people have. And I think it's, it's, it's across all sorts of um, practices. Yeah, the, uh, well, and we see, we see all over the world uh, asceticism and the mortification of the body in different religions um, all around the world. You know, that's, I mean, I keep saying that, but it's, it's my glib way of addressing that, you know, Catholicism did not invent self-flagellation. Right. right. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a real thing to like, I like the fact that you're doing that because it's a real thing that, um, to be frank, that a lot of white people need to learn um, is that it's not all, white people didn't invent everything. And the Western world didn't, invite, didn't invent everything. So I think it's, it's great that you're mentioning that and, and that it's important, so. Yeah, back to Clive Barker, a lot of the body modification and um, s and stuff that's integrated in his work, the s and community adapted and appropriated from indigenous cultures. You know, the suspension by hooks in the back. Like, yeah. yeah. Where'd that come from? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's indigenous to North America, but uh, it, it was not invented by the fetish scene, as far as I understand. Um, I do know there, I don't know which nation or tribe, but there is an indigenous American practice of, um, as, a, as a ritual, uh, a man would put, um, put spikes through the skin of his back and then tie stones off to the spikes and then he would walk until all of the all of the spikes had been pulled out, usually by tearing mm -hmm. flesh, uh, because it couldn't stand withstand the weight of the stones. I remember learning about this in in uh, Indigenous American history class twenty years ago. So it may not be it may not be historically one hundred percent accurate. Yeah, I wonder if there's a correlation between, um, you guys were talking yesterday about possession being okay in some religions and practices, mm -hmm. and then today also mentioning like, okay, if you talk to God, are you crazy or are you like chosen? And I wonder if there's like some sort of like correlation between religions, practices that like encourage um, like self- you know, mutilation essentially as a way to talk to God. Um, and those that are just like, don't even try to talk to God. Like it will, you know, like it will break you or that's actually the devil talking to you if you try. Because um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in Indonesia and like, you know, it's so interesting how shamanism is so much more okay there than it is here, um, I would say. And like, there's like, there's definitely sort of a, an understanding that like, yeah, you can talk to the divine. You can seek assistance, help, clarity, etc. And here it's very much like, if you try to say that you hear God, you're a charlatan or, you know, somebody else is talking to you. Right, and possession, getting back to that possession yeah. thing, a lot of, well, a, a lot of my work and a lot of other work, you discover that that the divine, you invite them in, um, particularly in um, Condomble or Voudun, you invite these often, I wouldn't say malevolent, but they're like both good and bad aspects into yourself and they ride you. And then that's where you get sort of the vision to figure out what, how to get rid of whatever issue you're dealing with. And you see people, you know, getting possessed by 
by spirits that aren't necessarily good, but by being possessed by them, you do get a little piece of the divine. Which yeah. is why I think that, you know, one of the, the uh, fan fiction ideas I've been bouncing around in my head is, you know, what happened to Reagan when she was possessed? You know, maybe it was a fantasy land. Maybe it was really fun or something rather like than- Like factory? Right. I it's, just that. Like, yeah. it's just like, oh, it's good. Oh yeah, you can make me cuss while I'm- you know, playing around in the universe. Crawl on the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> we. Yeah. Uh, we. But, yeah. <laughs> That's an, you know another another way that we see the white Western perspective show up across horror tropes is the idea that possession is bad, as opposed to enlightening. You know, plenty of plenty of uh, spiritual practices that involve being possessed possessed or channeling your ancestors, a god, you know. And it's all about, it's definitely about the perspective of it because, I mean, if you think about like cults and uh, motivational speakers, which I feel are <laughs> honestly in the same vein, have no. you ever seen those Tom Tim Robbins like people come out of that arena they're they're soup they're ants they're they're ready to go and they and rock another, on poles yeah right like they're they're ready to just take on the world and that in itself is a different kind of possession but it because it's done by lights and arenas and by one man who is giving you great advice it's it's allowed it's acceptable to be possessed by that kind of energy but when you know when you're and there i was actually um there's a um show on netflix called dark tourist mm -hmm. which um he goes to god i'm terrible with remembering names but he goes to an african nation i believe I don't remember. I can't, I'm not going to call out the wrong one, but um, there is self mutilization uh, um, as part of the spiritual journey. Um, and, you know, they tell him to step back, step back, because he's like a little bit into it. And he kind of steps forward a little too much. And this guy is cutting himself with glass bottles and all sort of stuff. So yeah, there's definitely practice that, that, that um, is part of it. Um, is it is it in Thailand where they have the street festival where people um, put put uh, blades oh, their and cheeks and weights from them? Does anyone know where that's? I don't know where it is, but I have seen that. Mm -hmm. seen that. I feel like that's in multiple. Probably yeah. that's my gut instinct to say that. One of the because isn't it kind of like when you're imbued with strength of like you know your faith or whatever like it can kind of like allow you to get through incredible pain is like part of yeah. it ecstasy religious ecstasy i was just about to bring that up because um one of my practices is called ecstatic dance and mm -hmm. um and so I, I do lots of different types of dance but ecstatic dance is designed to tie to take you through an ecstatic experience so it's um I mean, right, not right now, it's not going on, but usually every Sunday I go to this group and it's about 200 people with a DJ. It's kind of like all sorts of music, world music and stuff. And it starts out very quiet and meditative and it sort of like connects everybody into that space and then builds the energy up through the music and the energy of people dancing in the room until it's just this like swirly, you know, uh, frenzy of energy and you can literally like stand in the center of it and feel like you're in a hurricane you know but there's some sort of coordination that's happening there organically and one of the things I really love about that experience and that I get out of it is that it allows me to try out different ways of being in the world so whenever I go I might dance one way or I might dance a different way it's all just whatever you feel like doing and if I'm um you know, if I'm about to face something in my daily life that's going to be really challenging to me, I, I imagine myself putting on armor. I imagine myself like 
in some sort of drama during my dance that I'm fighting through and I'm feeling connection with my strength. And it's not necessarily a spirit outside of me. It's just like in me. And, uh, and then that allows me to inhabit that type of um, spirit, I guess, and bring that back into my daily experience. Um, I think that that relates to what you're talking about with different types of religious experiences and putting yourself through an endeavor in order to reach a different level of consciousness or to perceive something differently. Yeah, the, um, the ecstatic dance is found, I'll say it again, all over the world. Um, the, the Sufi Muslims uh, have have the process of you know if anyone's ever heard of whirling dervishes that's that's a sect of islam where they spin around dancing to reach higher consciousness on that note um <laughs> let's take some questions from the audience but first so we don't forget uh let's each go around and say uh, whatever project we currently have out that we would like to promote. Um, would anyone like to start? Where can the where can the audience read your work, find your work, et cetera? Um, you can find my work at my name, CraigLawrenceGidney.com. And Lawrence is spelled a unique way. So you have to pay attention to that. And I have a book that's being um written and serialized by ha um broken eye books hair's breath which is sort of like a rapunzel black girl magic black hair politics story um and then i have three short stories coming out this month including one that's sort of set in the ballroom scene and has cosmic horror and drag queens and what is that called and where can i read it it's going to be an audio story. It's from Tor's Nightfire thing, and it's okay. called Spider Threads. Hell yeah. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Um, Nadia? Oh, Nadia, you're mm -hmm. muted. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom warned me. They were like, you are muted and you're trying to speak. Um, just kidding. Um, so let's see. So my, I have a website, nadiabulkin.wordpress.com that I try to keep pretty updated. Um, my short story collection was 2017. So, um, it's not exactly new. Um, but let's see stories where I was recently published. Um, let's see. Uncertainties four, um, which I really like that story. It's about a girl who becomes obsessed with like a, uh, a, a missing person. Um, and sort of has a sublime experience at the end. Um, Nightside Codex, which is also kind of sublimey in that, um, sublimey in like racial identity. So um, might be kind of interesting to folks. Um, and then in Miscreation uh, Anthology, um, which has less on the time, but anyway, yeah. Thank you, Amanda. So my work is, mostly found on amandadownham.com, which is a hot mess of a website right now, but it does have links. Um, unfortunately, my short fiction collection is currently out of print, very hard to come by. I will be re-releasing it in ebook, you know, as the pandemic allows. Um, the most recent project that I will have coming out, which I would have been so happy to announce at HPLF actually, is um, I have an Arkham Horror novella called Dark Revelations coming out from Fantasy Flight. It's a tie-in to the Arkham Horror LCG, and it's a lot of fun. I love the game, and I had a lot of fun working with Fantasy Flight, and I'm happy to have an official Arkham IP out in the world. Excellent. Uh, Justin. All right, I'm muting myself. So, yeah, so... Um, a few stories uh, out uh, or coming out this year. Um, uh, One Hand in the Coffins is available from Strange Horizons. Um, and it, it's actually what I was thinking about when I was talking about dealing with like my own trauma of, of loss 
Um, as I said before, a section of Teresa Watkins is um, available from uh, Tor.com uh, right now. Both of them are novelettes. Uh, and I have stories coming out um, in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Escape Pod, Interstellar Flight Magazine, um, and Don't Touch That Anthology. All of them, I think, set for next year, except for uh, Interstellar Flight Magazine as part of their alternate um, ending 2020. Um, my story will be in The Flash in December. And also I'll be doing a KGB reading uh, uh, virtually like this, December 16th. Um, so those are some upcoming things for me. Thank you, Justin. Zim, where can we find your stuff? Oh, sorry. I thought you said Sam for some reason. I was like, who's Sam? So, <laughs> um, so I, my behind website, you. yeah, right behind you. Um, Sam, oh, sorry, Sam, oh God. Uh, you can find my website, which is still really under construction. I promise to get this done by next year. I really should. Uh, terryzen.com. Um, you can find my work. Um, I'm mostly in anthologies. Um, and I do have my tour.com piece called The Night Sun um, available on tour.com. And that's also a, it's a novelette and it's ready for sale as well on Amazon and, and IndieBound and things like that. Um, I do have other news that I can't quite share yet. And it's driving me nuts. I actually text my agent to find out and I can't. But um, if you just follow me on Twitter at Intelligent Twat, <laughs> um, you will find, uh, I, I will update right there what, what's going on, so. Sweet. Rose, what do you got going on these days? So I am vending at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival online. So if you go to the HP Lovecraft Film Festival website and look at the products, I created two links. There's one to find Eraserhead Press books on Amazon, and there's one to find them at your local bookshop. What I did was I created um, curated lists through my affiliate account. So I selected books that I would have brought to the film festival if I were there in person, ones that have sold well in the past or that I recommend to uh, cosmic horror readers. And so I definitely urge you to check that out. Our latest release is called Captain Clive's Dream World by John Bassoff. And it's kind of a Twin Peaks, Twilight Zone type story about a detective that moves to this idyllic small town where uh, everything is not as it seems and girls are going missing and it's really creepy and it, it takes place around this like old weird amusement park. Um, and I also would just really like to plug a book that we released last December called The Bizarro Encyclopedia of Film. And mm -hmm. it's this beautiful encyclopedia compendium um, that will walk you through what bizarro film is because uh, it's essentially like cult films, but you know, related to what we're doing in bizarro fiction in the publishing world, but in films. And that was edited by John Skip and Heather Drain, who are both total film buffs. So check that out. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the Mall of Cthulhu, which is a menu link uh, at the hplff.com, um, you can find many of these stories and books. Uh, Nadia and Craig and I have stories coming out in Weather Change from Broken Eye Books. That should be out right before the election. Um, yeah, subtitled- Is that a climate Weather change anthology? I'm sorry? Is that a climate change anthology? No, it's actually uh, Weird Revolutions. Okay. Yep. Um, mine is about uh, nationalism among superheroes like you do. Uh, um, and then uh, my my latest release that, that anybody can go find is uh, on Tales to Terrify. Uh, it is episode, I think, 447, my story, The Husband Suit, which I'm also reading live uh, tomorrow. I think at three it becomes available. And uh, Sunday, I'm teaching uh, an online workshop for a couple hours called Get Weird about 
making your writing stranger, more original, more memorable, etc. And in another life, if you if you enjoy drag queens, I wrote a drag queen RPG called Drag Star. All right. Now that we've gotten our now that we've gotten our plugs in, let's take a couple of questions. Um, was there a time when horror fiction influenced your perception of real life religion? I would say constantly. <laughs> for me. I, I, I feel like it has for me. Just I think just reading in general. Um, you know, so I I'm a uh uh I'm a Christian, but I'm also have like a kind of lifelong, I think, spiritual journey in terms of um, uh, finding out exactly kind of what what makes sense to me and what meaning and what I find most meaning in. And I think just sometimes going through and seeing like how different people can kind of interpret spirituality, interpret the world, and and also thinking of like the Bible as a written text, text of for interpretation has also kind of um influence my life and also the open up the possibility that okay no no one here may know have all the answers um so it's fine if i kind of try to think about like what possibilities there may be what you know heaven may look like for example like is it actually like sitting at the 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 side of God for eternity, or what does that might look like on a metaphorical sense? You know, maybe heaven is something different for me than it is for someone else. Um, you know, and I think that reading has, in, in fiction has kind of like expanded my mind a lot in that area, and which has been beneficial to me. Well, I was terrified of the omen and all that sort of stuff when I was growing up. And I was terrified that I would get possessed and all that. When I So my relationship with religious horror and actual religion are too messed up to, you know. I mean, I am personally, I, I call myself a pagan agnostic. And it's, it's pagan in the sort of like myth and ritual that resonates with me and agnostic as in, I don't have a fucking clue. And I'm very happy not to have a clue. Like to me, that's comforting. That kind of like insignificance in face of a greater cosmos is just fine. You know, I, I will never tell someone that I know the truth. And usually when people try to tell me that they know the truth, I'm a little skeptical. But, you know, it's it's very personal. And I think that definitely, I don't know, that's, it influences the way that I engage with cosmic horror and certain types of fiction and also the way I engage with the world. So I, I have no idea which came first. I think we can sneak in one more question. Um, Rose, this one might be especially good for you and anybody else on the panel who has non-mainstream spiritual practices, at least from a Western viewpoint. Uh, do you think the depiction of the occult in horror is harmful uh, to the way people perceive non-mainstream spiritual practices like paganism or Buddhism or even extreme forms of uh, Abrahamic Judeo-Christianity or Islam? Uh, 100%, yeah. It's a, a real injustice the way that mainstream media has portrayed occultism. And um, I think that it's, you know, in the same way that um, it, it's, a, it's a category that is disparaged in, in the same way that women are, are um, you know, misogyny is enacted against or racism is enacted against African Americans. Like it's another class of people that have been cast as um, evil or, uh, you know, very much frequently in Lovecraft, you know, the occultists are most often the evil forces. And uh, and yeah, I, I do think that it's an injustice. I, I have been dying to bring up because I mentioned him yesterday, but Richard Stanley, who directed The Color Out of Space, and I would look to him as an excellent example of someone who is producing mainstream Hollywood media that uh, handles 
occultist uh, ideas really appropriately. I mean, in Color Out of Space, for instance, he has an actual real life like shaman who inspired that character that Tommy Chong played. Um, and he also, all of the like magic that's in that movie and the, the um, symbolism and everything is, is real stuff. Like it was made by real occultists. It was made by people that are Im imbuing that movie with spells. Yes, which, and, and again, since we mentioned it yesterday, but didn't bring it up today, I'll just plug for the audience. Every should, everyone should go see A Dark Song. Agree. All right. Agree. <laughs> I just realized I was <laughs> muted, but I agree with the dark song for sure. So my takeaways are magic is in the eye of the beholder. Be gay, do crime. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. That's the thesis statement of today. <laughs> uh, I love all of you. I'll endorse that. All. Thank you all for being on this panel. You are all so brilliant. Um, hope everybody has a good con. Stay safe out there. It is crazy. It is crazy out there. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay, remember Bye. not to start revealing personal details because uh, we could <laughs> put this on YouTube. Like,